We have an invited speaker from Ecole uh, from Polytechnique Montreal. Professor Fabio Chiqueira is an associate professor in chemical engineering there. He received his master's degree from the University of Bologna in Italy and a PhD in Switzerland from uh, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Material Science and Engineering. And uh, since then, he was affiliated with the National Research Council of Italy and Cornell University. He also held a, a prestigious Marie Curie International Fellowship. Since uh, 2011, he's uh, affiliated with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Polytechnique Montreal, assistant and pro associate professor. His uh, research is on flexible, stretchable, and healable electronics, and he will tell us about this today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Thank you to all of you to come uh, here to listen to my talk about uh, our research in flexible, stretchable, and healable electronics. So I'm in the chemical engineering department at Polytech Montreal. It's uh, no longer a called Polytechnic, now it's just Polytechnic. And uh, on the new logo, now we have also technological university. So it's a new thing. OK, of course, I don't have to explain much where we are. So just very close. I don't have to explain where Quebec is unless uh, you just uh, came here. Maybe someone just came uh, to Canada, so you know Quebec is there. Here you saw a couple of days ago that uh, it can look like this. Usually, you know, if I talk uh, to people in Singapore, they're impressed about this, but here, a little bit less. And this is, uh, this is, uh, uh, what, these are some of our building at Polytechnic. At least we have much better view than you have at McGill. So we have nice view over the city and the mountains. And our building is actually a little bit behind. It's a Bombardier building. It's a, a building where we have uh, research facilities and soon will be shared between the engineering physics and the chemical engineering department at Polytechnic. So about uh, my research, uh, as I said, I'm in flexible, stretchable, healable electronics. Here you have a few examples of what is already available in flexible electronics. Uh, flexible electronics is mostly based on organic materials, unless a few exceptions. But uh, the reason is why these materials are more suitable for, uh, to make, to achieve at the same time conductivity or maybe optical properties and uh, mechanical properties. So you can use flexible uh, electronics to make uh, flexible or bendable displays or uh, lighting systems. You can make flexible uh, transistors and also flexible uh, photovoltaics. Uh, nowadays, OLEDs or uh, displays are commercial. You can already find uh, bendable displays or curved displays, and you can find the flexible, uh, flexible uh, photovoltaics. So, flexible electronics, flexible organic electronics is already a reality. Now, what I like about organic materials is that they are quite uh, versatile in terms of processing. So, you can use uh, traditional deposition techniques like uh, thermal evaporation, uh, spin coating, but you can also use uh, printing in uh, its different forms. Here is an example of uh, inkjet or uh, screen printing, but nowadays you can also do 3D printing with organic materials. And what is very important is that uh, if you want to achieve very high resolutions, you can uh, also process these materials with uh, photolithography. So, of course, with printing techniques, you cannot achieve micron or sub-micron resolution, but uh, with lithography you can. And naturally now there is a technology, and we use it, to achieve high resolutions with organic materials. Again, what are other merits of the organic materials, in particular of uh, conducting polymers? I uh, will come in, in a few minutes to the explanation of conducting polymers. So the processing is always done at the lower temperature with respect to inorganic materials. You can go probably at 100 degrees, maybe 200, but this is low compared to processing temperature of uh, inorganic materials. Then the synthetic chemistry can modify these materials, so you can add functionalities to organic materials. It's much easier to add functionalities to organic material than to inorganic ones. Then, this is something very important, you can uh, switch between redox states of materials and at the same time change the properties gradually. For instance, you can uh, tune the color of uh, a organic conducting polymer by applying a bias by changing gradually its state, uh, oxidation state. So you can go from a completely dark material to completely clear. And also, you can go from one color to the other. Then these materials, uh, if engineered in the right way, they can be flexible and stretchable, which is required also for application in biology, like for uh, implants. And of course, they can uh, also make smooth, so-called interface to living tissues. Then again, you can have uh, 
materials where you can have both electronic and ionic transport. And this is also very important if you want to interface these materials to living systems. And also another important thing is that uh, many of the devices I will show today, they can work in aqueous environment, which is again very important for biological applications because you know that all the biology takes place in an aqueous solution. Then at the end of the story, we can say that uh, this material, they do not want to compete with silicon because silicon is very good for uh, uh, ultra-fast electronics, for uh, uh, microprocessors, but we want to do things that we cannot do with silicon. So we will like to complement silicon electronics. Then right now, there are many challenges open for uh, organic materials. So the way to process these materials can be versatile, but at the same time complex. Then you can get film deposition by different uh, techniques, and uh, it's not still very clear how to control, for instance, the crystallinity of the morphology of the films. Then patterning this material is still a challenge, even though there is a technology. And then uh, also we have to face the long-term stability and also understand how is the physics or the chemistry of this, uh, of this material. So one of the devices that, uh, on which I work most, uh, we work most of my group, is the so-called organic electrochemical transistor. So essentially, organic electrochemical transistor is uh, a transistor in the sense that it's a three electrode system where one electrode is used to control the current flowing between two other electrodes. But anyway, the working principle of this device is a bit different with respect to, let's say, traditional field effect transistor. So uh, here is also the, the structure of the material that uh, it's the material I mostly use in my research, which is called uh, P.PSS means uh, poly 3 4 ethylene dioxytiophene doped with the polystyrene sulfonate. So this is the conducting polymer itself. You see the conjugated structure, so alternance of uh, double and single bonds without which you cannot have any conductivity. So this conjugated structure is essential in any organic semiconductor, otherwise there is no conduction. And to increase the conductivity, we have this so-called chemical dopant, which is uh, an anion, a polyanion in this case, but it's a negatively charged species. So the presence of this uh, dopant makes this material highly conductive, and uh, it makes a, a highly whole conductor, uh, efficient whole conductor. So it conducts electron deficiencies. So you see here, this is uh, like an example of a film of this material between two metal electrodes. And this is what happens if you apply voltage. So you have uh, electron holes flowing between one electrode to the other, depending on the polarity you apply. And these uh, minus here are the dopant negative ions. So because of the presence of these dopants, you can have this high conductivity. This is just a simple two electrode system. Then, of course, I also listed the properties of this material that makes it interesting for uh, our application. So it's, uh, it's an advantage you can buy this material commercially. Uh, then I will explain how we process it. It's uh, relatively easy to process. The conductivity you can achieve is uh, fairly high. It's about a few hundreds of uh, Siemens per centimeter without uh, any particular treatment. Then these films, are, once you obtain these films, they are stable in water, so you can uh, use, it, uh, use them in bioelectronics and also at a neutral pH, which uh, corresponds to the physiological conditions. Okay, now I take my devices, I add uh, something else. So I add a third electrode and an electrolyte. Electrolyte can be any salt. So something which uh, dissolves into negative and positive ions. So now we have the same device. Now what I do, I apply a voltage to the third electrode. In this case, it's a positive voltage. So I have uh, negative ions go, going close to the electrode and the positive ions move far from the electrode and going at the interface between the conducting polymer and the electrolyte. So what happens at this interface, some ions, they go into the polymer and they compensate some of the negative charges of the dopant. This is equivalent to say that you have this uh, redox process. So you go from the oxidized state of the pivot to the neutral state, which is much less conductive. So in this way, you decrease the conductivity of the polymer. And in this case, you also modulate the current. So you obtain what is a transistor effect. So, so you use the voltage applied to this electrode to control the charge flowing between these two. The interesting thing is that uh, if you have this architecture, you can achieve this uh, uh, current modulation at a very high voltage. So all these devices work uh, below vo one volt. They also have to work below one volt because you want to avoid the electrolysis of water. Okay, so what are the applications of these materials, of these devices? Actually, they have, they have already been used for uh, in vivo recording of brain activity, electrocardiographic recording, uh, neurogrid, so there are many applications. 
And what we are doing now is to look at uh, several things. So we look at the, the device physics. So we look at the effect of the different materials on the device performance. Then we are trying to find different ways to process this material to improve at the same, at same time the stability, the mechanical properties, and the electrical properties. Then we are able to pattern this material. So we are able to make devices, even with a quite high resolution, with the, these materials. We are making flexible stretchable devices, self-healing devices, and also stretchable nanofibers. And if I have time, I will also talk about the implantable, implantable neural electrodes made with these materials. So what we do, we work a lot on the fundamentals. So we try to understand what happens in these devices, uh, how we can improve the stability. Then we are also developing technology to pattern this material and to make uh, materials that are stretchable and flexible. And finally, we are trying to make devices for application in uh, biology, biology interface. OK, our strategies uh, go through different steps. So we, have the, we work on the materials. So we work a lot on the proce processing of the material to achieve uh, a good compromise between uh, uh, electrical and uh, mechanical properties. Then we make the devices. So we not only we process the material, we make the device. And also, what we try to find is to find some new properties of these materials. So let's start from the processing of this material. Actually, we deal with the mixture, which is something uh, I realized that uh, chemical engineers like a lot to deal with mixtures. So essentially, what we do, we can uh, buy this material from a company, and it's sold as a, a water dispersion. Uh, but if you use this material as it is, you get very low conductivity. So what we want to do first is to improve the conductivity. And actually, for some reason that I will not talk about today, the conductivity of this material increases by orders of magnitude if you mix it with one of these compounds, which in most of cases, they have OH groups. So the increase of conductivity has something to do with these OH groups, but it's, it can be up to three or four orders of magnitude. So the first thing you have to do is to mix this commercial suspension with this material and process film out of it, and then you can increase the conductivity. Then sometimes you have additional problems of the films to a substrate. Then one uh, uh, method to improve the addition is to use a silent-based chemistry, so cross-linking with silent uh, uh, species. And this has been shown to improve the addition of uh, conducting polymers, especially on uh, inorganic substrate. And then if you want to make flexible or stretchable devices, you need to add surfactants to the films. Again, the reasons are not still, still not very clear, but you have to do this if you want to work with a flexible or a stretchable substrate. So this, just to give, to give you the idea that uh, it's simple to process this material, but we have to find the right way to mix them with other components. So we have to play a lot with the mixture. Uh, this is an example of what can happen to your conducting polymer film. So we found this a few years ago. So if you make a film of this conducting polymer on a substrate, and then you soak the film in different uh, solvents, you can have thickness decrease. So it means part of your film is dissolved, especially if you use a polar solvent as water. So actually, this is something you don't want, especially if you work in biology. You want to lose part of your film because uh, uh, you immerse the film in water. So this is where the cross-linker comes to help. For instance, here we see that uh, if we add the cross-linker to the, to the film, you see that uh, here is the, the thickness. The two colors correspond to thickness before and after water immersion. You have uh, no uh, variation of the thickness in this case if you immerse the film in water. Of course, if you had a cross-linker, you decrease the film conductivity. So this is where you have to find a compromise between uh, uh, stability and high conductivity. Then this is something of the effect of uh, electrolyte. Uh, you have seen that uh, in my picture of the working mechanism of the device, you have an electrolyte. And of course, the performance of this transistor depends on uh, which electrolyte you have in this solution. And we found out that one of the electrolytes that work best to have a good transistor performance is a, a cationic surfactant. Here I have an example. So you have a transistor with an electrolyte where the electrolyte is cationic surfactant. The other, sorry, this is a simple sodium chloride. This is the cationic surfactant. And here just a if you, if you want to understand these plots, I have to explain a little bit what they are. So this is one of the ways to characterize transistor. So in general, for a transistor, you plot a current versus a potential while another potential is fixed. So we have three electrodes. This VGS means gate source voltage. So you are changing the voltage of the electrode, which was on the top before. And you are keeping constant 
the drain source voltage. So this is the voltage between the two planar electrodes. So if you want to have a good transistor characteristic, you want to have a, what is called high on-off ratio. So you want to have a high ratio between the on current, which is this one when the device is on, to the off current, which is when the device is off, ideally. And this, in our case, is between, uh, you see, between uh, minus 0.6 uh, volts to 0.6 volts, so in a quite narrow voltage range. So actually, we want to have this uh, value as high as possible. And you see here that if you use the surfactant with respect to sodium chloride, you have much better performance. These plots also tell you another thing. I don't know if you can follow that. But uh, you can see that our transistor is, uh, if we don't apply any voltage, is uh, in the on state. So you have to apply voltage to switch the transistor off. And this kind of transistors, they are called uh, depletion type transistor. So they work in depletion mode in the sense that you apply voltage to switch them off. This is because we start from a highly conductive material and we uh, decrease its conductivity by applying the voltage. The another thing you can notice here, which gives you also an idea of the effect of the parameters, these uh, plots are at different thicknesses. You can see that uh, the higher is the thickness of the material, the more difficult it is to achieve a high on of ratio. This is why, because uh, these materials, they work, the working mechanism includes all the bulk of the material. It's not like field effect transistor where only the interface between the semiconductor and the gate dielectric is involved in the working me mechanism. But the, here, actually, the doping, the doping process takes place in the bulk of the material. So if you have uh, thicker films, it gets more difficult to dedope. So this also tells you that uh, the performance also depends on the device thickness. Here, again, is a, a little bit of electrochemical characterization of our device. Again, here we compare the device in sodium chloride and device in a surfactant. And actually, what we notice is that uh, w actually we operate our devices in air. We don't have, uh, we don't have, we don't, uh, not in a glove box because we want to, to use this for biological applications. And actually, when you operate a device in air, in aqueous solution, you have a lot of uh, oxygen dissolved in water. Not a lot, but you have a certain amount of oxygen dissolved in water. And actually, when you reduce the material during your uh, uh, while your transistor is working, what happens is that the, the oxygen in solution really reoxidizes re the material. So you cannot get a very, high, very low of current, as you see here. So you are not able to go down with this value because there is the oxygen that reoxidizes this material. The oxidized state is conductive, so you cannot really decrease the current here. But what we found out is that if we use the surfactant, we decrease the oxygen content in the solution. This is reported by several papers. And by decreasing, the oxygen content in solution, we can also prevent this uh, reoxidation of the material. OK, then uh, we also worked on the material for the gate electrode. This is the electrode on the top. We tested many materials, and we found out that the best material is this one. So it's a carbon paper with uh, activated carbon. Actually, it's a dispersion of activated carbon on carbon paper. And the reason why this material works better than others is because it's, uh, it's conductive, but it's, it has a very high surface area, and it's a uh, quite non-reactive with respect to the species you can have in solution. So the way to say that this material works well is to compare them with a system where an electrochemical cell where we have three electrodes, counter reference and uh, working electrode. You just replace the reference and the counter with carbon uh, paper. You see that the cyclic voltammetry overlap. So this means that uh, use, using this uh, carbon electrode, you can really be sure at uh, which potential you are in your device. And uh, it's very stable. So you can uh, replace uh, carbon to the reference electrode. You get the same uh, devices. And actually, you, can, you, you don't need the reference electrode in your device to know at which uh, potential you are. And you can cycle the, safely the material without undesired uh, parasitic reaction between a certain voltage range. Again, comparison of device performance. Here we compare an electrode of uh, a gate electrode of activated carbon with one of conducting polymer. And you see again that you can uh, switch off much easily the device if you have the carbon electrode. OK, then we started to work on um, flexible devices. And here is the example, one example of what we can do now. So these are a flexible micro organic electrochemical transistors on plastic. Uh, this plastic is just regular uh, PET, polyethylene terephthalate, commercial sheets, very, very cheap, very easy to obtain. And actually, we were able to perform a photolithography on these materials, first by depositing the metal contact, then the 
conductive polymer, then etching, we were able to make devices like this. So you see that the dark area here corresponds to the conductive polymer is about 10 microns wide. It's not, uh, it's not very high resolution for uh, conventional lithography, but it is for, uh, for lithography on soft substrate with organic materials. So actually what we can do, we can cut uh, our uh, PET in form of wafer that we can process uh, as it was a, a silicon wafer. The only thing we do, we change completely the chemistry of the lithography. So instead of using the traditional uh, uh, photoresist uh, developer and etcher, we use a completely different uh, product line, which is based on fluorine chemistry. And the reason why it works is that uh, you know that uh, fluorinated materials, they are completely orthogonal to aqueous and organic systems. They are not miscible with both of them. So if you base all the lithography on fluorinated material, you're not going to destroy your conducting polymer, which is an organic material. Actually, all the photoresins that are now used for uh, silicon photolithography, they are organic, so they would uh, destroy this material by decreasing the conductivity and sometimes even by just dissolving the film. So if we use these materials, we are completely safe. We can use exactly the same equipment because we just use the same photolithography equipment. We just have to adjust the, the lithography parameters like the exposure time, etching time, and, uh, and the developing time. So actually all the patterning we do on these materials is now done with this uh, uh, product line, which is uh, sold by a company called Orthogonal, which is based uh, in uh, Rochester, New York. Of course, then we made these uh, flexible devices. Then sometimes you have, uh, people talk about flexible electronics just because they put uh, materials on plastic, plastic, but actually we tested them. So we took our devices, we bended many times, about 500 times, and we looked at the change in current after 500 uh, bending. And actually, you see that uh, the change in current is very low. It's about uh, 4% with respect to the initial current. So actually, these materials are really flexible. They can be used in uh, flexible electronics. Actually, this is also in function of bending percentage. Up to 70% bending, 500 times, you only lose 4% of the initial current. OK, this is, again, an example of what uh, we have to do. So this is a, a two-step process. You first deposit the metal electrode, then you have to do a second process with another mask to bridge the gap with the, with the conducting polymer, and these are the results we can obtain. So we can go down to five microns. We cannot go below that just because we don't have the right equipment, but in principle it's possible to go below one microns. Electrical characteristics, so this is a typical, another way to, to show the transistor characteristics. This is, uh, again, the current flowing between the two planar electrodes versus the, versus the voltage between the two electrodes. And here we change the voltage of the third electrode. Again, you see here that uh, if you don't apply any voltage, the material behaves as a conductor. You have ohmic behavior. Then you apply voltage and you switch off the channel and you reach uh, the off current, which ideally should be as low as possible. See the same thing here. This is, again, current between the uh, versus the gate voltage at fixed drain voltage. You see good uh, switching characteristics. Low hysteresis, which is uh, very important. You can achieve this only if you make your uh, channel very small. So if you don't have uh, too much material and if you have a very small gap between uh, source and drain, otherwise your ion movement is slower compared to the movement of the electrodes and this uh, results in uh, high hysteresis. And uh, also other information is that you can cycle the device. This means that uh, this doping, the topping, the topping process is to some extent reversible. Of course, after uh, maybe hundreds or thousands of this cycle, we will get some irreversibility, but for a reasonable number of cycles, the stability is pretty good. And then, of course, uh, the other message is that you can all, always work at very low voltage, so below one volt. Okay, after flexible, we move to stretchable. Uh, why? One of the reasons is that uh, if you want to make wearable devices, wearable electrodes, for instance, you want something that is as, at least as stretchable as our skin. And by stretchable, again, I mean something that doesn't, for, for electrical devices, you want uh, electrical properties that do not change upon stretching. So for instance, you want the same conductivity of a material if it's uh, unstretched or stretched to about 30% of its uh, initial length. So we achieved that. OK, of course, there are uh, many other people working on this uh, topic. We achieved that by. Uh, setting up a new process. So again, if we want to make a device, you need to at least a two-step process. One, to make the metal electrodes. Unfortunately, we still didn't find a replacement for metal electrodes in device, so we still have to pattern metals. And then we have to pattern the conducting polymer. 
And all this process we made on uh, a, one of the most conventional elastomers used in the research, so polydimethylsiloxane or PDMS. So we were able, we were able to achieve flexible, uh, stretchable devices on PDMS. This is one of the, strategy, of the strategies we use. Now we are finding other ways to do that. But actually the way we work is that uh, we use the so-called uh, buckling technique, which was, which was uh, initially developed in uh, uh, George White Science Group in Harvard for uh, metal electrodes. So what we do, we put our device under strain, uh, our substrate, PDMS substrate under strain. The, this is quite thin PDMS layer. It's about a uh, <coughs> few hundreds of microns. Then we carry out all our process while the device is under strain. So we carried out the metal uh, patterning polymer pattern, and at the end we release the device. So at the end we have a buckled substrate with devices on it. Uh, what is very nice here, you can see here, is the, this is the current of the device versus strain. You can see that uh, by using the buckling method, you have uh, a stable current up to 40% strain. It starts to decrease after 50%, but up, up to 40% you have quite unchanged current characteristics. And if you look at the cyclability, of course, you have, these are more than 1,000 strain, strain cycles between uh, 0 and 40%. And you see that the current decreases a little bit, but you still have uh, something which is conductive after thousands of cycles, which is uh, quite remarkable. Then, of course, a few words about the processing. So first of all, it's not trivial to metallize PDMS. It's actually very challenging, even with the lithography. And then we had to find an uh, Kind of new process to make this. The way we did it, uh, we, we used the transfer patterning. So we started with a PT sheet on which we deposited the pyrrolein layer. Pyrrolein is very thin polymer layer that can be patterned by conventional lithography. We patterned the pyrrolein by conventional lithography. And then we transferred the pattern from the PT to PDMS just by sticking the, PDM, the PT on the PDMS. PDMS is much sticky than uh, PT, so the parallel layer would transfer, the pattern of the parallel layer would transfer to the PDMS just by contact. Then we remove the PDMS and we have this uh, pattern of parallel, which uh, acts as a mask, for instance, if we evaporate uh, gold contact. I should have a video about this, and you can have an idea of uh, what happens. So this is uh, our PDMS covered with a parallel mask after the deposition of gold, and now we just remove the, the pyrrolein at the end of the process. That's the pyrrolein that we remove. And uh, you see that uh, removing the mask leaves the patterned substrate. So these are gold contacts, and you see that uh, actually there is no failure in the process. All of them are as expected. So this means that the process works very well. Okay, so uh, the video is lasts for some time because I wanted to show that there are no failures, but actually I can probably accelerate it. And uh, what is nice is that uh, at the end of the process, you can even uh, recover the mask and use it again for another substrate. Uh, okay, so this step is the metal deposition, and the following step is the conducting polymer deposition and patterning, which is uh, done in the same way that I, show, that I showed for the flexible substance, so orthogonal lithography. At the end, we get something, some devices like this. So you see here, this is the gold, and the, this dark part in the middle is the conducting polymer. And here you can see the comparison between uh, the substrate, the unbuckled substrate and the buckled substrate. Yeah, actually, you see that the surface is very different. So you have this uh, buckling that allows to pull, if you want, the substrate without consequences of, uh, on the electrical properties. Again, we characterize the device uh, electrical. You see the same, uh, the same kind of behavior you observed in the other device. The only difference is that the devices are not as good as they are on PT because PDMS is more problematic as substrate. Now we know how to circumvent this problem. But anyway, this shows you that each time you have a new process and you have to adapt it to have the maximum you can get. Here we have stretchability, but your transistor characteristics are not so good, but then you can adjust your transistor characteristics by again working on the processing. Then again, what I showed you are micro devices on stretchable subset, but actually we can make devices that are completely stretchable. So if you want to have an organic electrochemical transistor which is completely stretchable, all the components of the device must be stretchable. So you want stretchable electrodes, stretchable conducting polymer, stretchable electrolytes. So we did that by applying the buckling method to make the 
conductor and the, sorry, the metal and the conducting polymer. We have this time the gate, which is a platter. And we added a, a stretchable hydrogel as the electrolytes. This is uh, how it looks like. It's based on, on a kind of conventional acrylamide chemistry. We just modified the process a little bit. We used the NaCl instead of lithium, just because it's much uh, cheaper. And then we could make a device which is completely stretchable. And the characteristics are shown here. So you see here the characteristics at 0, 15%, and 30% strain. They are almost identically. So this shows you that uh, these devices can be stretched up to 30% by keeping the same characteristics. Just uh, this is the way we characterize the device. We have our tensile tester, homemade tensile tester connected to the electrical probe station. We make the contacts here to this uh, source and drain. And the gate is also planar here. And you can see here that uh, the acrylamide, the hydrogel, the, it really follows the, the PDMS. So it's as stretchable as the PDMS at least. OK. And uh, again, now, very recently, now, OK, this is some articles under review. We have found a way to make stretchable devices without the buckling system just by playing with the thickness and the temperature at which we treat this device. So now we can even skip the buckling process because sometimes you don't want a buckle substrate. If you want something that it's, uh, uh, you want something that to adhere very well to the skin, for instance, the buckling can disturb. In this case, we can do it uh, without it and we still have devices that can work up to 30% uh, strain. Yeah, okay. The next part is about uh, self-healing. So after talking about flexible and stretchable, now I'm talking about self-healing ability of this conducting polymer. Why we do that? Uh, self-healing materials are, I mean, there are a number of self-healing materials, but there are very few self-healing conducting materials. Very often, this material can heal, but uh, the, the time required for healing is very large in the scale of hours, even days sometimes. Then, usually you have to add some healing agents to the material to make it healable. And uh, sometimes also you can, uh, you need to add, uh, uh, I mean, to treat them with solvents to bring them at high temperature. And uh, actually very few, uh, not so long ago, the first uh, organic semiconductor that are healable has, have been reported. So we show that the self-standing P.PSS film can be self-healable. First thing was how to make uh, uh, freestanding films, so we developed uh, again a process uh, to make uh, films which are self-standing. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, time to bake the film and cooling it and to immerse in water, but finally we have a procedure to make this. And then naturally we perform the experiment, which is uh, actually very nice. So we did a very simple experiment. We made a small circuit, so you have uh, an LED here which is uh, powered by a battery or a power supply, and uh, part of the circuit is a uh, a quite thick P.PSS film. The thickness is about uh, five microns. And you can see here what happens. So the film is there, then we, we cut the film with a blade. And of course, the current is interrupted. But then we put uh, some water and the current is back. And you see here that the current is really back. So this is the current before the cut, and this is after the cut, after the, you put the water. So it's really a water-induced healing. And the nice thing is that uh, it's kind of reversible. It can, it can happen many times. You, we can cut the film as many times as we want on different locations, and we can still heal it. And the other very nice thing is that this process is very fast. You can see it's, <coughs> it's uh, on the resolution limit of our instrument, which is about 200 milliseconds. So it's much faster than any other uh, healing of electronic materials reported so far. Then, okay, we went to have a look to what happens to the healed part, and you see actually that this is the cut just after you pass with your blade, and this is after you put water. So actually there is material when there was not material after you cut. So it's, really, it's a real healing process. So you restore your film after the cut. Sorry. Yes. Are you applying a field when you're healing? No. We did, uh, we did it with the field without... Uh, but you don't need the field, yep. In the case I showed you, yes, because we were powering the LED, but uh, we can stop applying the field and uh, it, it always works. Uh, what we have here also very interesting is the response time, which does not depend on the numbers of cuts. So it stays always between about 0 0.2 uh, 
seconds, so 200 milliseconds. But this is more related to the resolution limit of our instrument. Uh, then what we did, we tried to use other liquids to heal the material. And the first one we had in mind is uh, this fluorous material we use for uh, lithography. And naturally, you see here we cut, we put the fluorinated solvent, nothing happens. But then we put water on the same cut and you recover the current. So water is needed to have this uh, healing. We also observed some something with the alcohols, but it's much less effective also because the, the alcohols we tried are much more volatile than water. Then what about mechanism? We are still trying to understand the mechanism. We believe that it's uh, related to the swelling. So these materials are very well known for swelling. They can uh, increase up to uh, three or four times their weight if they're immersed in water. And we believe this is associated to the increase of volume also. So what could happen is that you have two separated parts. You put them in water, they swell, then they end up in touching. This is just something we suppose. It's not even clear we have to prove this mechanism. Then another idea we had is uh, let's try this material in, uh, in uh, humidity conditions. What's, let's see what happens. So this is a same measurement carried out in a humidity chamber. We cut in the humidity chamber, and then we change the humidity. We don't, don't observe much up to 80%, then we start to see the current increasing. And uh, if we increase to about 90%, we have almost a total recovery of the current. So this means the materials can be healed also by the vapor. Then, again, the other idea was let's wet the materials before cutting them, and you see what happens. It's, there is no effect. So you cut, and you see also here, current doesn't change. So there is a kind of instantaneous healing of the material. Why? We still don't know, but we are probably close to find an explanation to this. So if you have a material which is wet, it becomes a so-called autonomic healable material. OK, uh, some applications. It's something I always say to my seminar, because uh, the first time we submitted the article, the referee said, uh, it's nice, but uh, there are no applications for this thing. So we had to find an application, and actually we found. Maybe a little bit artificial, but it's here. So we put the cat film on the arm of a student, of course, not uh, my arm. Uh, but it's already cut. Uh, and then uh, we have a wireless transmitter. We can heal the film on the arm, and we can transmit the effect of the healing to another wireless transmitter, which is quite far away. I don't know if you find this useful, but the referee did, and uh, he accepted the article. So for me, it was <laughs> very useful. So, uh, and, but can be useful. And uh, another application is simply you make a transistor. Transistors, electrochemical transistors, they work in aqueous solution. You can cut the transistor as many times as you want. It doesn't, uh, you see no effect of the, of the cut. Now, next step, uh, we are going farther. I cannot talk too much about this because it's not uh, still in preparation. But we have found some formulation for which uh, the external agent is not required to achieve healing. I have an example here. This is a dry, dry P dot PSS film. Again, the same setup. And uh, you will see someone cutting. The, yes. So you see now we cut the dry film, and uh, we don't observe any any change. So it's possible to find appropriate formulations by playing on the mixing of PDOT, for which you don't need to apply water to have the healing. And this actually could be a very interesting, uh, a very interesting material for some applications where you require self-healing. I uh, cannot tell you much about that, but it's based on uh, the addition of some polymers, which we believe make the material more viscoelastic. But this is real, still under investigation. Then we also we wanted to understand the effect of the swelling. So we had a look at uh, how this material swells. So here there are several plots of weight increase versus soaking time for different formulations. So we changed the surfactant, the polymer. And you can see that uh, actually there is a quite large swelling for each of these uh, uh, formulations. And this can in part explain why, when you add water, you have this uh, healing. But still, they're not explaining because for some systems, you don't need water. And you, we, actually, we are still working on this. OK, I think I used almost all my time. I just want to say a few things about uh, another activity we have. So we can also make uh, stretchable electronics based on uh, conductive fibers, which are uh, uh, produced by electrospinning. So the way we make this, it's by first we make uh, fibers of uh, any 
spinable polymer, for instance, uh, PVA, polyvinyl alcohol, or, or poly polyvinyl pyrolidin. And then we add to these fibers uh, an oxidant, which is uh, basically an iron tree. We expose the fibers to the monomer of EDOT, and uh, in contact with the fiber, the EDOT will polymerize. And finally, we can remove the core of the fiber to get, uh, to get only the shell of the fiber. So these are the fibers after the retrospinning and polymerization. These are after this, the solution of the core. And actually, you can make interesting things with these fibers. These are like uh, an attempt to get stretchable conductor. As you can see that, of course, the fibers are random. So you have conductivity. Also, the conductivity is random. So if you stretch the material along a certain direction, you will break some of the fibers, but some will survive. And you can actually stretch your material up to more than 100% of initial length while still keeping a certain conductivity. It's not ideal because the fibers are not oriented, but it's also another way, interesting way, to get uh, uh, stretchable electronics. So unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about the application for, uh, in, um, for neural electrodes. Maybe some other department have to invite me for a seminar. I can uh, conclude with this. So the most important message from this is that uh, we can uh, pattern these materials on almost any kind of substrate and make uh, any kind of uh, devices. But the very important thing for me is the discovery of the self healing ability of P.PSS. And I want to point out that uh, the good thing of this process is that it's water triggered, so triggered by a very simple chemical, or autonomic. So we don't need any complex solvent uh, heating or uh, nanoparticles. It's a very simple process. And also the way we make the samples is simply quite simple. And what is also very important is that uh, this material has a high conductivity to be a healable material. And then, of course, we are still uh, working on a possible mechanism. And, uh, of course, we are trying to find uh, also applications for these uh, materials, these devices, especially for flexible electronics. Uh, concerning what we are doing uh, for brain electrode, I can just say a few words. Is that uh, electrodes, brain electrode, neural electrode, are used more and more to uh, treat some uh, diseases. And uh, what you want for this kind of electrode, you want them to be implanted for a long time. So you don't want a strong reaction of the tissue around the electrode. And, and you don't want that the properties of the electrodes deteriorate with the time. So of course, most of the electrodes which are used until now are based on metals. And uh, you know that the matching between the metal and the living tissues is not always ideal. What we try to do is to cover the metal with conducting polymer to have a, a weaker foreign body reaction and also to, to have uh, electrical properties that uh, do not deteriorate with time. And uh, now we are just in the process of uh, implanting these electrodes um, in uh, rats or mice. And, uh, we are just getting the, the first results. I can just show you what happens. These are, uh, this is the impedance of the electrode at, uh, after a certain amount of time. And we compare here the performance of a metal electrode with the conducting polymer electrodes. You can see that the impedance of the conducting polymer electrode is always uh, lower than the platinum electrode, which is something you want for uh, implanted electrodes. But if you look at what happens after a certain time, it's not really clear. So we need to have higher statistics to, to prove that these electrodes are better. But we were successfully successful in implanting these electrodes in the first uh, animals. OK, I will uh, stop here. I would uh, like to thank uh, the agencies uh, which made this uh, work possible. And uh, also, of course, I have to thank the people who actually made work, uh, which are the people from uh, my group. And I'm uh, very happy to have this such an audience uh, today here and uh, thank you for your attention thank you very much very interesting talk uh, questions Uh, I was just wondering if you have uh, investigated the the maximum cut size that you that uh, you can heal, or if you have, if you, if you put two separate materials with a specific distance between them and just pour some drops of water on it, it's gonna heal or it's just effective for cuts. It's a very good question. We didn't do this yet because we just because uh, I still didn't find the right tools to do it. It's 
quite uh, strange, but I didn't find tools which are better than razor blade to control the cat. Uh, now we are trying to find some surgical uh, knives to do that. But I believe that we can also get uh, cuts that are larger than what we got so far. The question, if you cut materials and you uh, put them close to each other, doesn't work. You have to cut the film, put a drop of water on it. Otherwise, if you just take uh, two different pieces of pivot and uh, you put them one close to the other, you put water, it doesn't work. For the, for the other healing, the dry healing is, uh, I think the process is a bit different. But anyway, if you stick two pieces together, they won't heal. They won't uh, solder, I would say. Other questions? So I have two questions. <clears throat> First, uh, if you say that, at least for the wet healing sample, if it's actually swelling kind of three times, if you pattern such a sample, does it, doesn't this swelling mess up with our patterning? If I have a pattern of five microns and I want to heal it, I add drop and turns to 15 microns. And if I have a 10 microns gap, it's going to be filled. And the second question is that, uh, do you, did, did you try to play with the stiffness too? Because I mean, 70% strain is super impressive, but probably don't strain your brain that much, but maybe you, you want it to be softer a little? Okay, first question. It's something we are trying. So to achieve the cut by patterning, uh, we are not su successful yet, because you have to reach, I think we have to reach a, a compromise between the thickness and the size of the cut. Then there is another thing. When you, when you cut the material by lithography, by pattern, you use oxygen plasma usually, which changes the chemistry of the material. So the process might not be the same, but sometimes we have obtained a partial healing by pattern substrate, but it's not successful yet. So right now we have to have films which are pretty thick and uh, cuts which kind of macroscopic. But we are actually, we're trying to move towards uh, thinner films because, uh, you know, five, 10 micros is not really realistic for, realistic for application. Uh, the other question is about, sorry, the stiffness. stiffness. You mean uh, changing the mechanical properties of uh, PDOT? Yes. We are doing it right now. Uh, for what I showed now, we just played with the PDOT plus the material that uh, we added to increase the conductivity. If you look at the spontaneous healing, here the mechanical properties are definitely different. Young modulus is completely different, but we are still in the process of measuring this. We are doing this in collaboration with the company. The measurements will be done uh, this week. But uh, I mean, all your questions are really impressively pertinent to what we are doing. Okay, other questions? Hi, thanks. Thanks for the great presentation. I was maybe two question. So I mean, coming back to your cut, that's really interesting. I was wondering whether you had looked at trying to chemically characterize whether there was different in the material. Uh, I know it's XPS, or I don't know what kind of tough sims or this type of thing. We did, but uh, the problem with this material is that it's uh, you have uh, uh, carbon, oxygen, sulfur. Then uh, no, in the cut you will you would have the same. So chemically, I don't think it's really interesting. Um, I, I think the key of the explanation of this is more on the mechanical properties, especially for the spontaneous healing and in the swelling. I don't believe chemistry plays a great role there. And uh, another thing is that I don't really know which, OK, besides the XPS or other vacuum-based techniques, I don't know which technique could allow to look at uh, what happens at the chemical bonds there. If you have suggestions, I'll take. But, uh, Right now, I don't know. Okay. Well, I'm afraid I don't have suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> it's not really my cup of tea. Yeah. Uh, maybe another question related. So you, you, you worked on, on, the, on regular PDMS, and you're working on brain implants. So one of the things. Regular Silgard PDMS. Right. For well, the so you know, one of the things we learned from the people who do brain imaging is that this, the brain can swell, especially during surgery, like up to 10%. And so if you have electrodes implanted, they can readily move. So I, I, I mean, I, I so saw you. So EMS would swell? No, the brain. Ah, ah, OK. Yeah, ah. so the everything. Pushed. OK. And, and so I don't know, have you considered that? Or have you also considered not just deep brain electrodes, but yeah, like Well, deep brain electrodes, uh, 
Uh, I, I didn't really present because uh, what we did till now, we implanted them, we measured uh, the impedance uh, every day, we characterized, but we don't have the data of uh, the histology. So we don't know what happens. But I guess that in terms of mechanical response, uh, the response to our ETSO will be very similar to the response to conventional platinum iridium electrodes because we just have a coating. We don't change, we don't change the mechanical properties of it. So we, we are not really at the stage where we use soft electrodes. Okay, thanks. This, the, the cutting, do you say that, with the, that you can't take two pieces, bring them together, and they will they'll Well, heal. we tried to do work. So if you take a piece, cut it, pull it apart, and then push it back together quickly, does that? It's quite difficult to do it, uh, to handle these uh, things. Uh, I guess we tried, but uh, still not successful. Just doesn't follow up. If you put two pieces together, put water in between. I'll try. This I'm not sure we tried, but uh, so thanks. <laughs> Actually, in another, another uh, seminar, they asked me what happens if you cut the material, wait for one week, right. and you put the water. Right. We did it and it didn't work. I so I could not find who asked the question because I would think. Okay. So. Other questions? <laughs> I have a quick question on application. Um, you were the referee. Or? <laughs> so. I wasn't the referee. <laughs> that. So, uh, but uh, it's a, it seems to me like it would be a good um, um, sensor for humidity, right? Yeah. Humidity. So there are places where you need a good control of humidity, such as for agriculture purposes, right? You need to have controlled environment for grains or other things that can be that need to be stored. So maybe that's one possible application. Sure, unfortunately. I cannot talk uh, about it because I have to sign the contract, but uh, I've been contacted by a company who wants to develop uh, with this sensor, but the application is something I couldn't even imagine. It's so weird that uh, it's, I still don't believe it. I, unfortunately, I cannot talk about this in public. But yeah, there is, a, there is an interest. Uh, on my opinion, you can have uh, simpler um, detectors than this. But if, I mean, if the companies want to fund the research on this, I agree. I explored a little bit the field. It seems like it's needed. There is a need for yeah, a yeah, sensor. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, the other question I had also about applications, it seems like these are relatively large in size. Do they need to shrink when you, to make it? Uh, I think, yeah. To, uh, to and can you shrink them? What are the limits? Uh, that's what we are trying. So we have tried to decrease the, so what I think is that if you make thinner films, you have to make smaller cuts. We have to find a way to, to make smaller cuts that we still didn't find. Again, one, one of the ways is to use lithography, but again, I think that uh, there might be changes in chemistry then you are you're dealing with another material. Uh, we are thinking about using AFM to cut. There are, there are a few thoughts about this, but we still didn't do it. Okay. If there are no other questions, Thank you again. Thank you very Thank much. You very much.